This next chapter is called Taking Attendance. I flew to London a few weeks later. I was covering Wimbledon, the world's premier tennis competition, and one of the few events I go to where the crowd never boos and no one is drunk in the parking lot. England was warm and cloudy, and each morning I walked the tree-lined streets near the tennis courts, passing teenagers queued up for leftover tickets and vendors selling strawberries and cream. Outside the gate was a newsstand that sold half a dozen colorful British tabloids, featuring photos of topless women, paparazzi pictures of the loyal, royal family, horoscopes, sports, lottery contests, and a wee bit of actual news. Their top headline of the day was written on a small chalkboard that leaned against the lax the latest stack of papers, and usually read something like, Diana and Roe with Charles, or Gaza to team, give me millions. People scooped up these tabloids and devoured their gossip, and on previous trips to England, I had always done the same. But now, for some reason, I found myself thinking about Maury wherever I read anything silly or mindless. I kept picturing, the, picturing him there in the house with the Japanese maple on the hardwood floors, counting his breath, squeezing out every moment with his loved ones. Well, I spent so many hours on things that meant absolutely nothing to me personally. Movie stars, supermodels, the latest noise about Princess Di or Madonna or JFK. In a strange way, I envied the quality of Maury's time even as I laminate, laminated its diminishing supply. Why did we bother with all the, the distractions we did? Back home, the O.J. Simpson trial was in full swing and there were people who surrendered their entire lunch hours watching it, then taped the rest so they could watch more at night. They didn't know O.J. Simpson. They didn't know anyone else involved in the case, yet why give up days and weeks of their lives addicted to someone else's drama? I remember what Maury said on our last visit. The culture we have does not make people feel good about themselves, and yet you have to be strong enough to say, if the culture doesn't work, don't buy it. Maury's true to these words and had developed his own culture long before he got sick. Discussion groups, walks with friends, dancing to his own music in the Harvard Square Church, he started a project called Greenhouse, where poor people could receive mental health services. He read books to find out new ideas for his classes and visited with colleagues, kept up with old students and wrote letters to distant friends. He took more time eating and looking at nature and wasted no time in front of TV sitcoms or the movie of the week. He had create, created a cocoon of human activities, conversations, interactions, affections, and it filled his life with an overflowing soup bowl. I had also developed my own culture. Work, I did four or five media jobs in England, juggling them like a clown. I spent eight hours a day on a computer, feeding my stories back to the States. Then I did, a t did TV pieces, traveling with a crew throughout parts of London. I also phoned in radio reports every morning and afternoon. This was not an abnormal load. Over the years, I had taken labor as a companion and had moved everything else to the side. In Wimbledon, I ate meals at my little wooden work cubicle and thought nothing of it. On one particular crazy day, a crush of reporters had tried to chase down Andre Agassi and his famous girlfriend, Brooke Shields, and I had gotten knocked over by a British photographer who barely even mumbled sorry before sweeping past, his huge metal lens strapped around his neck. I thought of something else Marie had said to me. So many people walk around with a meaningless life. They seem half asleep even when they're busy doing things that they think are important. This is because they're chasing the wrong things. The way you get meaning into your life is to devote yourself to loving others. Devote yourself to your community around you and devote yourself to creating something that gives you purpose and meaning. I knew he was right. Not that I did anything about it. At the end of the tournament and the countless cups of coffee I drank to get through it, I closed my computer, cleaned out my cubicle and went back to the apartment to pack. It was late. The TV was nothing but fuzz. I flew to Detroit and arrived late in the afternoon, dragging myself home and went to sleep. I awoke to a jolting piece of news. The unions at my newspaper had gone on strike. The place was shut down. There were picketers at the front entrance and marchers chanting, chanting up and down the street. As a member of the union, I had no choice. I was suddenly, and for the first time in my life, out of a job, out of a paycheck, and pitted against my employers. Union leaders called my home and warned me against any contact with my former editors, many of whom were my friends, telling me to hang up as if they tried to call and plead their case. We're going to fight until we win, the union leaders swore, sounding like soldiers. I felt confused and depressed. Although the TV and the radio work were nice supplements, the newspaper had been my lifeline, my oxygen. When I saw my stories in print each morning, I knew that in at least one way I was alive. Now it was gone. 
And as the strike continued the first day, the second day, the third day, there were worried phone calls and rumors that this was going to go on for months. Everything I had known was upside down. There were sporting events each night that I, had, I would have gone to cover. Ugh. Instead, I stayed home and watched them on TV. I'd grown used to thinking readers somehow needed my column. I was stunned at how easily things went on without me. After a week of this, I picked up the phone and dialed Maury's number. Connie brought the phone to him. You're coming to visit me, he said, less of a question and more of a statement. Well, could I? How about Tuesday? Tuesday would be good, I said. Tuesday would be fine. So here's a flashback. In my sophomore year, I take two of his courses. We go beyond the classroom meeting now and then just talking, meeting now and then just to talk. I've never done this before with an adult who is not a relative, yet I feel comfortable doing it with Maury and he seems comfortable making the time. Where shall we visit today? He said cheerily when I enter his office. In the spring, we sit under a tree outside the sociology building. And in the winter, we sit by his desk, me in my gray sweatshirt and Adidas sneakers, Maury in his Rockport shoes and corduroy pants. Each time we talk, he listens to me ramble. Then he tries to pass on some sort of life lesson. He warns me that money is not the most important thing, contrary to the popular view on campus. He tells me I need to be fully human. He speaks of the alienation of youth and the need for connectedness with the society around me. Some of those things I understand, some I do not. It makes no difference. The discussion gives me an excuse to talk to him, fatherly conversations I cannot have with my own father who would like me to be a lawyer. Maury hates lawyers. What do you wanna do when you get out of college? He asks. I wanna be a musician, I say, a piano player. Wonderful, he says, but that's a hard life. Yeah, a lot of sharks, that's what I hear. Still, he says, if you really want it, then you'll make your dream happen. I want to hug him and thank him for saying that, but I'm not that open. I only nod instead. I'll bet you you play the piano with a lot of pep, he says. I laugh, pep? He laughs back, pep, what's the matter? They don't say that anymore? 